Hi, it's Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thank you for joining us today for our Facebook Live on cluster headaches. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Dr. Friedman, who is Chief of the Division of Headache Medicine and is the Founding Director of our Headache and Facial Pain Program. Dr. Friedman is also one of a handful of physicians with special expertise in evaluating and and treating conditions that overlap the fields of headache medicine and neuro-ophthalmology. So before we get started, don't forget, as normal, you want to make sure that you like and share the conversation. If you hear things that you think are fascinating, make sure you hit that wow button. And then also be sure to write your questions in the comments section of the field. We will take as many as we can get to. And we also want to thank the National Headache Foundation for sharing the chat and letting their followers know about it. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with Dr. Friedman. Thank you for joining us again. You're very welcome. So, you know, last time we talked about migraines, this time we're talking about cluster headache. What is the difference between the two? There is actually a huge difference between the two. And a lot of people mistakenly think that when they have a lot of migraines back to back, mm -hmm. or a lot of any other kind of headache back to back, like several days in a row, that that means it's a cluster headache, mm -hmm. but not true. Cluster headache is its own individual, very special kind of headache. Right. So um, cluster headaches generally occur more commonly in men than women. Mm -hmm. um, it's about twice as common in men than in women, although women certainly do get them. And we can talk about that later if you want. Um, and they can start at any age. Mm -hmm. So children can get them. People can start getting cluster headaches in their 90s even. Um, so they can occur any time throughout life. The headache itself is one of the most severe and excruciating types of pain known to humankind. Um, and so for many people and for most people, the pain is usually centered around one eye. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's on the same side of the head every time. Mm -hmm. The pain comes on suddenly. It peaks within seconds, maybe minutes to worse than 10 out of 10 in severity. Oh, it is horrendous, excruciating pain. People describe it like somebody's sticking a knife in my eye, mm. somebody's sticking a hot poker in my eye, um, somebody's drilling into my eye, um, and it's usually centered somewhere behind the eye. Um, and the hallmark of cluster headache is that it's accompanied by what are called trigeminal autonomic symptoms. Okay. So these are symptoms that come from the nervous system called the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems. Mm -hmm. So in order to have a diagnosis, you should have at least one of the following um, associated with the horrible pain. Mm -hmm. So on the same side as the pain, a droopy eyelid, mm -hmm. a small right. pupil, a bloodshot eye, tearing from the eye, and this is not just tearing because I'm crying, it's uncontrollable tearing from the eye, either a stuffy nose or a runny nose. Um, you can have facial flushing. Mm -hmm. um, some people have fullness in the ear. Um, and uh, it's these autonomic symptoms that we really like wow. to hear about. And unlike migraine, people with cluster headache tend to get restlessness and agitation, which I think is sort of an understatement. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. migraine patients generally like to lie down in a dark, quiet room, don't mm -hmm. bother me, right? Right. Cluster patients try to distract themselves from the pain. And it's actually right. part of the headache. So they will often get up and pace. Mm -hmm. They'll bang their head against the wall. They, oh. I have patients that have like slammed other body parts against concrete walls and bruised themselves. Wow. I have patients that dig their fingernails into their palms of their hands to the point where they're bleeding. But, but whatever the severity of the self-inflicted um, distraction, mm -hmm. people distract themselves. Wow. The headaches themselves are not as long as migraine. Mm -hmm. They last between 15 minutes and three hours, okay. but they can occur numerous times a day. Mm -hmm. So they're called cluster because they come in clusters, right? right? So they can occur anywhere from every other day up to eight times a day. They often wake people up from sleep at a very mm -hmm. specific time during the night. So they're characterized by what we call circadian periodicity, mm -hmm. meaning that throughout the day, for many people, they tend to occur at certain specific times. They're like clockwork predictable. Mm -hmm. They often also have what is called circannual periodicity. So there are two types of cluster headache. Mm -hmm. One is called episodic and one is called chronic. Right, we're gonna talk about that. The episodic type is the most common. About 80% of people have episodic cluster headache, um, which means that they get these bouts of cluster headache that go on for 
several weeks, sometimes several months, mm -hmm. but then the headaches go away. And they resurface again at some point down the line, which is often unpredictable. But for many people, it is predictable. Mm -hmm. So there may be like a certain month of the year that they tend to occur. Oh, no. A lot of times, I'm glad we're doing this now because the most common times they occur in fall and spring. Often around really? the time when we reset the clock for daylight mm -hmm. savings time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an episodic cluster. The only thing worse in the cluster headache world is chronic cluster. So these are people that basically never get a break. And sometimes they start with episodic cluster and then they kind of evolve into chronic cluster. Mm -hmm. But some people start with cluster headaches and they just never go away. Wow. Or if they get a break, it's less than a month within a year's period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can imagine, this is a horrible, horrible, debilitating, disabling yeah. condition to have. That's it. It Makes sounds... migraine look like fun, and migraine's no fun. No, but this... cluster headache is horrible. So we had a we had a lot of comments leading up to this. People were talking about you know this caused mine, that caused mine. I mean, what are the, what are the triggers that are known? Well, as far as the cause, um, it's like kind of like migraine that we really don't know exactly right. the cause. Occasionally with cluster headache, we'll find something structural in the brain. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll find a tumor, usually it's near the pituitary gland. Okay. Sometimes we find a problem that's in the back part of the brain called the brainstem. Mm -hmm. But most people with cluster have a totally normal MRI scan of the brain. Okay. The most common and the most well accepted triggers for cluster headache, besides the period of the year, the time of the year, right? right? And we don't know why either, um, is are alcohol, mm -hmm. which is a pretty reliable trigger in most cluster headache patients. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, nitroglycerin, which, you know, we don't take nitroglycerin unless right. we have a heart attack, right? <laughs> but when we do um, experiments of cluster headache and we try to induce it in people, mm -hmm. like to do functional mm -hmm. imaging, they give them nitroglycerin. Oh. Now that said, some people with cluster headache will report triggers similar to those of migraine. Some, some people will have food triggers and hunger and, and right. things like that, but usually it's, it just comes out of the clear blue sky. It's got a mind of its own. Oh my gosh. So we're, we're starting to get some questions in and definitely now's a great time to start sending those <laughs> questions in. We've got one here from Lori. She says, are there any preventative measures that can be taken to block the onset of it? Or you kind of just, you got to deal with it. As far as preventive treatment, there are act, there's actually no evidence that taking a preventive medication will prevent the bout from starting. Okay. Um, and I do have patients, the most common preventive medication we use is verapamil, mm -hmm. which is marketed for high blood pressure, very high doses of verapamil, much higher than we would ever, ever use for patients who have high blood pressure, um, which can sometimes cause problems that we mm -hmm. have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But um, there's no evidence that taking verapamil in between bouts will prevent the bout from occurring. Okay. Although some people are afraid to get off of it, and right. I understand why. Um, there are preventive medications that we use when people start their cluster bout. Mm -hmm. So what are the, yeah, once it's already started, are there ways to lessen it perhaps? The dura either the duration or the intensity? Right, so the acute treatment of the headache itself, mm -hmm. so people get a headache, they wanna take something, um, the most commonly used treatments are either the triptans, mm -hmm. um, like sumatriptan, zolmatriptan, sometimes risotriptan. Remember, these are headaches that come on almost instantaneously. So we, ought, we wanna use medications that get in the system very quickly. Okay. And taking oral medications is usually not the way to go because it, by the time they get absorbed and they get circulated through the bloodstream, mm -hmm. you know, someone's been suffering for 30 minutes. So we tend to use injectables, mm -hmm. nasal preparations, or very fast acting oral triptans. Okay. The other kind of um, tried and true um, acute treatment is oxygen. Very high flow oxygen. Okay. It's administered by a non rebreather mask, which is the mask that drops down from the airplane when the right, cabin right. pressure goes out, right? Um, and uh, many people with cluster headache find that if they inhale high flow oxygen, um, within about 10 or 15 minutes, it's helpful. It doesn't work for everybody, but it, it often does. Yeah, that's interesting. I read about that somewhere. And so what does the oxygen do? I mean, what does that provide that something else wouldn't? Do we know? It's not really clear. I mean, we know that oxygen constricts blood vessels. There's mm -hmm. a lot more to cluster headache than just constricting blood vessels um, of, of why it works. But um, the, the science of why it works is not that that's well right. understood. It was actually discovered by a headache specialist, Dr. Kudrow, 
um, who had cluster headache. Oh, of course. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense then. Well, I want to <laughs> I want to go back a minute. You were talking a little bit earlier about men and women. Yeah. And what is what is the difference between men and women? You mentioned that men get it more often. Right. right. But it's there's more a reason common in men. Of that. Okay. It is more common in men. And it used to be that they said it was, you know, middle-aged male smokers. And a lot of people who get cluster headache are smokers. It's not mm -hmm. certain what um, is the, the absolute connection of behind that. Um, but the, the problem is cluster headache tends to be misdiagnosed a lot. Okay. And it's the average duration between the time people get cluster headache and the time they're diagnosed is three years. But I've seen people who have had cluster headache for 25 years and they've never been accurately diagnosed. Many of these patients are women because again, there's this kind of folklore out there that women don't really get cluster headache and they mm -hmm. certainly do. And many people with cluster headache, I think in particular women with cluster headache, mm -hmm. tend to have migraine features with their cluster headache. Okay. So they may have sensitivity to light and noise, they may have nausea and vomiting. Mm -hmm. You can have all those things with cluster headache, okay. but they're not required for the diagnosis of cluster headache. And I think it, it throws people off mm -hmm. when they have a lot of migraine symptoms. Okay. It is also not that unusual for people to have both. Mm -hmm. And I have plenty of people in my practice, again, predominantly women, who started out with migraine, and then later on in life, they wow. develop very typical cluster headaches, and some people have both. Wow. So we've got, we've got some more questions coming in. This one is from Emily. So Emily asks, could cluster headaches result from a concussion? Actually, Emily, that's a great question. And it is certainly possible to have post-traumatic cluster headache. Uh, we okay. see it sometimes in, our, in people that have served in the military who have had head injuries. Mm -hmm. um, and having a, having a traumatic head injury can produce cluster headache. Wow, that's a good question. All right, we've got another one here from Misty, and you addressed this a little bit. Misty says, are these bilateral or unilateral? They are unilateral headaches. Okay. And during, for people who have an episodic cluster headache, during the bout, mm -hmm. it's always on the same side. Sometimes it switches sides, you know, the next bout. Right. <laughs> but um, it, it tends to be almost exclusively on one side of the head, the same side every time. Okay. And Susanna asked a very similar question. She said, are they always on the same side? And yes, yes they During are. During a bout, yes. Okay. So is it typical that if somebody has a bout on one side that they'll always have it on that side? You mentioned it could... It Every could so try. often it'll shift sides oh, for some people, but most people it, it pretty much likes one side better than the other. It just sounds terrible. It's creepy. Yeah. Like anybody out there who's never had a cluster headache, go on YouTube and watch a video of what it's like. It'll, it's really an eye-opener. So what, so people that have cluster headaches, what kind of treatments are available? What can, what can they do now? Anything? Okay, so we kind of talked a little bit about symptomatic treatment of cluster. Mm -hmm, right. Um, so there are sort of three phases of cluster treatment. The first is symptomatic or acute treatment. Then there's transitional treatment and then there's preventive treatment. Mm -hmm. So the transitional treatment is to try to sort of slow the headaches down while we're waiting for the preventive treatment to kick in. And the major transitional treatments are steroids, corticosteroids like prednisone, um, and nerve blocks. Okay. So um, a greater occipital nerve blocks, usually they're mm -hmm. done with a little bit of corticosteroid. It sounds strange because the greater occipital nerve's in the back of the head and the headache's usually in the front. By the way, the headache can radiate to the back. It can radiate into the jaw, into the teeth, into the neck. Um, but uh, occipital nerve blocks seem to work well. Uh, and then there's another kind of block called the sphenopalatine ganglion block. Okay. So the sphenopalatine ganglion, um, I may have to bring my friend the skull out. Oh, do, please. To show you, but it basically lives right back behind the sinus. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at Mr. Skull, uh, it's going to be right back behind that bone over there. Mr. Skull. Maybe it was Ms. Skull, I don't know. Bad teeth, whatever it was. Um, and so the sphenopalatine ganglion, it's like a relay station okay. for various nerves to come together. That's what a okay. ganglion is. So the nerves from the parasympathetic nervous system, nerves from the sympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. and then the part of the trigeminal nerve, okay. the part that supplies the cheek area, mm -hmm. they all kind of come together in this one little mass of tangle of nerves mm -hmm. called the sphenopalatine ganglion. And we call it the SPG for short because it's just too long to say sphenopalatine ganglion. Um, and we know that the SPG has a huge role in 
cluster headache. Okay. And so it used to be that the only way we could block the sphenopalatin ganglion was for a radiologist or an anesthesiologist to get a great big old harpoon needle mm -hmm. and under fluoroscopy go through the face. But we can actually access the sphenopalatin ganglion through the nose. So okay. there are a couple of catheters that have been developed um, that go up the nose and dump a bunch of uh, wow. using lidocaine mm -hmm. um, into the side of the nasal cavity um, and it kind of drips back into the sphenopalatine mm -hmm. ganglion area. Mm -hmm. um, and many patients will get very good relief with that. Sometimes we have wow. to repeat them, but often it's very helpful. So is, will they get relief for a couple months or is there, is there a Sometimes time it actually there? stops the bout wow. when we're lucky. Yeah. Um, sometimes we have to repeat it. Sometimes they'll get you know a week or two mm -hmm. worth of relief, which is a big deal when you're going through this. Absolutely. Um, and then the, the third part of the treatment is called preventive treatment. Mm -hmm. So again, verapamil um, is probably the number one that has the best evidence for it. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other medications that we use. Um, for example, lithium, although lithium has been used for a long time, it's a difficult drug to take. It has a lot of side effects. It has a lot of drug interactions. It requires a lot of monitoring. So okay. I'd say most of us probably don't go to lithium as a you know, number one or number two choice anymore. But um, gabapentin can be used, topiramate, okay. um, valproate, some of the drugs we use for migraine prevention. Um, melatonin can okay. sometimes be helpful. Um, what else? There's Memen memantine. There's not right. a lot of evidence, but there's some anecdotal experience with memantine. Um, Lamotrigine can sometimes be helpful, oh. um, and uh, you know then we're, we have some new things on the horizon and some new devices that just came out. We'll have to talk about those. Leading into another... the next question. Yes, right? we got another question. This one is from Shelby. So she says, "I'm so glad I found this. We're glad you found it too, Shelby." She says, "I was in a car accident two years ago, and I've been getting headaches. I'm just getting over one that has lasted two days. I'm showing signs. I'm showing symptoms of migraines. Could this be a cluster headache?" If the headache itself lasted for two days, Shelby, chances are it's not cluster mm -hmm. because the intense pain of cluster headache usually does not last more than for about three hours. Okay. So probably it is migraine. And you can get autonomic symptoms with migraine too. They're not exclusive to cluster. Mm -hmm. okay. So the tearing in the runny nose and all that kind of stuff, you can have that with migraine. Okay, good question. We've got another one here. Can cluster headaches cause permanent damage to your eyes or your nervous system? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, one good thing. Maybe to your um, psychological system, but okay. seriously. Yeah, <laughs> good question. So let's see, we've got one here from Abby. So Abby says, sorry if this was already asked, but what are the main symptoms of cluster headaches? Yeah, I think we, we already went through that. So we did. sorry for purposes of time. I'm yeah, so we'll, we've got that at the very beginning. On, uh, Go to the very the beginning replay. of the chat. Sorry, we've got one from Susanna. So Susanna says, could seizures and cluster headaches be related? I haven't seen that question before. I haven't either. Um, I actually have a patient that has headaches that are kind of similar to cluster. I wouldn't say they're necessarily cluster, and they trigger him to have what look like seizures. But in general, there's not a huge association between seizure and cluster. There is an association between seizure and migraine, between epilepsy and migraine. Okay. That's pretty well established. Okay. It's an interesting question. They keep coming in, keep sending them in now. We've got one from Mars. He says, do you see patients with migraine who pace? Like pace around the house. He says, sometimes my pain is so great I can't lay down, so he's up wandering around. But they resemble the migraine phenotype type. He says he has symptoms of migraine that resemble the symptoms described for cluster. But he says, my prodrome and postrome sometimes have a hyperactivity component to them. How do you differentiate the two disorders? That's a lot of information there. That is a lot of information. I think maybe first, have you seen, do you see patients with migraine who pace? I have, but it's unusual. Okay. And it always makes me wonder if there's really some underlying little cluster component lingering in there. Okay. there you know, there's no official diagnosis for people who have migraine with cluster features. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what else to call it because mm -hmm. that's, what I call, that's what I end up calling it. Right. But there are people that have a lot of features of migraine and their, their headaches don't quite meet criteria for cluster, right. but maybe they wake up at the same time every night with them, maybe right. they pace with them, maybe they get a few autonomic symptoms. Mm -hmm. And whenever I hear about that, even though I can't officially say it's cluster, it usually kind of sways my treatment. Okay. And I tend to use medications and treatments that we use for cluster um, as opposed to those that I would necessarily, you know, think about first line for migraine. Okay. 
And so then the second part of his question was, you know, chronic migraine versus cluster. How do you differentiate those two? Again, it, it's the description of a headache, really, mm -hmm. okay. and the duration of the headache. Okay, that helps distinguish them. Okay, well let's let's go on this really good question. Let's go on to some of the newer therapies that are available. I know you're involved in a number of clinical trials, and there's some new devices out there. Sure. What are those sorts of things that people should be on the lookout or no or thing to ask their physician about? Okay. So the newest device that was just FDA approved and uh, came on the market this summer is called the Gamma Core device, mm -hmm. and it is an external vagus nerve stimulator. We were okay. actually part of the clinical trial here at UT Southwestern mm -hmm. um, on that device, um, and it is currently available on the market. It's a, a little device, it's about the size of an electric razor, um, and it stimulates the vagus nerve, which is a great big nerve that comes from the brain that goes to all different parts wow. of the body. Um, and it stimulates it from the outside. So mm -hmm. you don't have to have surgery, there's no wires, there's no wow. nothing invasive about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But it, it kind of lives right next to the carotid artery in the neck. Okay. So when patients start to get a cluster headache, um, they turn on the stimulator, they um, put a little gel on their neck, and they put it usually on the same side as the pain, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they apply it, and it delivers a pulse of stimulation, which can be regulated by the user um, as to the intensity of the stimulation, but it stimulates for two minutes, and you repeat it several times. And actually, the, the clinical trials that were done showed that at least a third of people who used the stimulator got either excellent relief or uh, improvement in pain, mm -hmm. or relief of pain, total relief of pain within 15 minutes. Wow. So the nice part is it's very safe. I mean, so far there have been no signals that there's any um, untoward reactions from mm -hmm. it. Um, it's portable, unlike an oxygen canister, right? Yeah. It's portable yeah. and you can use it multiple times a day, mm -hmm. unlike the triptans where there are quantity limits, right? right? Um, so that's new and, and uh, so is that something that it, that a patient could carry with them, or is it something they would need to go to a physician's office? They need to have a prescription for it. Okay. Um, and uh, the device would be sent to them, and then the company has a way of, it, it's good for a month, and then yeah. if the patient needs more, then they sign up for more. Okay. So, but it's one of those things that if it works, you're gonna know pretty quickly. When they did the clinical trials, there was also a signal that people who used it frequently tended to have a reduction in their headache frequency over time. So like many of the neuromodulation yeah. techniques that are happening in headache, there seems to be a long-term effect, not just uh, the immediate relief. Wow, that's that sounds like a really good, great yeah. option for some people out yeah. there. So I know you're recruiting people for some current clinical right. trials. Do you want to talk about those for a minute? Sure. There's one that we just finished that I'll tell you about, and there's yes. one that um, we're recruiting for now. So the one that we just finished, the data are not analyzed yet. We're still following up the patients is a sphenopalatine ganglion stimulator, mm -hmm. okay? um, which is why I brought Mr. Skull. Yes, show us. <laughs> so this is a very cool thing. Um, it is a neural stimulator that gets put in by uh, an oromaxillofacial surgeon. Okay. It gets inserted up through the gum line, and then it ends up, it's about that big, so it's not very big. Um, and on the bottom are the places where it gets screwed into the jawbone. Okay. And on the top, there are little um, areas that provide stimulation. But there are no wires. It's all controlled externally. Um, and it's programmed to stimulate in the places where it's most effective for the patient. Wow. So there's some personalization here. So basically, they take the device and they put it right up under the gum line, okay. um, up into the space that's called the pterygopalatine fossa, which is mm -hmm. where the sphenopalatine ganglion lives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the patient heals from surgery, and then they get their stimulator programmed. And there's the control is actually external. It's okay. a little controller. It's about the size of a cell phone. And when the patient gets their headache, they hold it up to the face, and they turn on the stimulator. Um, wow. So it's actually been... Pretty sounds... cool. I mean, I don't know the results of the trial, and yeah. you know, I was a, an investigator, and I don't know if my patients had the real stimulation or the sham stimulation or what they got. Right. Um, but it is already on the market in Europe, and um, okay. they they were you know got good enough results so that it's already being wow. done there in clinical practice. Wow. The trial that we're recruiting for, and this is also hot in migraine, mm -hmm. um, are these calcitonin gene receptor 
um, sorry, calcitonin gene related peptide, that's why we call mm -hmm. it CGRP, uh, monoclonal well, antibodies, right? So these are, there's four companies making them. Um, they're all given by either injection or IV infusion. Okay. Um, and one of the companies has a trial in progress. It's a nationwide clinical trial for cluster headache. Everybody's studying them for migraine. Mm -hmm. um, right now, only the one of the companies is studying it for cluster. Hopefully the others will soon. Okay. Um, but we're looking, our particular site is studying chronic cluster headache. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking for patients, I think it's between the ages of 18 and 65 with chronic cluster headache. Okay. Um, and uh, there are other sites in the country that are also looking at episodic cluster headache. Correct. Patients get um, three injections under the skin um, that are given at periodic times and they either get the real thing or they get the placebo. Okay. Um, and after the main outcome is determined, um, then everybody gets the real thing. So there is an open label phase. So if you want to participate in that, go to our website, search for cl find a clinical trial. You should be able to navigate and be able to, elite, to send your information if you're a candidate or not a candidate for that. That'll be open soon. We have about three minutes left oh. for maybe one more question okay. if it's coming in. But I think one thing would be helpful if we could, re let's review, like what are the symptoms of a cl cluster headache? We could go back one to the more basics. Time. One more time. Okay severe, sudden onset of pain, okay. centered usually around the eye on one side of the head, may radiate to the back of the head, into the cheek, into the jaw, into the neck. It's excruciating. It's usually not throbbing. Um, patients generally get agitated with them. They yep. distract themselves. They don't usually lie down. They may rock back and forth. They may get up and walk. They may inflict other bodily injury. Yeah. Um, associated with those trigeminal autonomic symptoms, mm -hmm. tearing, bloodshot right. eye, droopy eyelid, swollen eyelid, stuffy nose, runny nose, fullness in the ear, um, facial uh, redness or facial sweating, right. um, lasting anywhere between 15 minutes and three hours, often recurring anywhere from every other day to eight times a day. So if you're a caregiver for somebody or you're with somebody that has cluster headaches, is there anything that somebody else can do to help? Should you just stay away? It sounds like dark rooms don't help. I mean, realistically. Should maybe get the guns out of the house. Oh, no. we, didn't, we didn't talk about this. We were going to, right? You were, yes. Yeah, so the so cluster headaches are called suicide headaches. And um, sadly, there's a good reason for that, that the risk of suicide with cluster headache is about 20 times the general population. Um, so it, it, it does have a severe impact on people's life. Okay. But just recognizing that it might be cluster headache, I think is a first step and okay. going to see a headache specialist or somebody that's really well versed in this um, can make a huge difference. And really, if for those of us who do this for a living, you know, when, when we get people better who have cluster headaches, there is no doubt that we have given them their life back. It is. Um, a wonderful thing to be able to see. Yeah, awesome. Well, we are all out of time. It is exactly three o'clock. I want to thank everybody that tuned in. Looks like we had a really big crowd. So thank you for all of your questions. Thank you to the National Headache Foundation for helping support this chat. Thank you to Dr. Friedman for You're joining us. You're welcome. My pleasure. Have a great day.